Hello. Uh... Hey, Nick. <laughs> how are you? I'm all right. <laughs> Good, mate. Check one, two. Hello, hello, hello. Check one, two. We ready, Warren? I'm ready. What's that song? Um... And I say hello, hello. And I say hello again. Hello, it's Nick Cave. <laughs> Can't do it. Hi, it's uh, Nick Cave here. Yes, I say hello, hello. Hmm, yeah. Okay, so I'm Nick Cave, and we are here to uh, talk about the B sides and rarities record part two. I'm Warren Ellis. Okay, Warren's decided to be very zen in this. <laughs> He's been... <laughs> I've been given orders. <laughs> orders to rein it in. I've got the muzzle on. He's gone very zen and he's only saying the occasional word. I'm Warren Ellis. Uh, it's great to be here with uh, with Nick Cave in the uh, Soundtree Studios in Shoreditch, where we've made lots of stuff. Carnage. For example. Yeah, for example. And this has been our place of work during the lockdown. Yeah, it's our spiritual hub. And and we're here to talk about the B-Sides and Rarities record, the second part of the B-Sides and Ra- Rarities record, as we essentially put the second part together ourselves, me and Warren. We're going to talk about it. I think you must have called me during the lockdown about this, putting it together. You said it was like time to update the, the first part of the rarities because there was more B-sides in existence and unreleased tracks. And also I think that part one had never come out on vinyl, if I'm correct. When my love comes down, down a sea There's there's a a question here. Whose idea was it to create the B-Sides part two? And it was my idea, as most things are. (laughs) But then I make a phone call and get... uh, I I, I love to... um, Delegate. Delegate. I'm a great delegator. The great delegator. I am the great delegator. Comes down, down to see you. Well, I'm 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 on the coal face. Well, you're quite happy to dip into the archive and have a look what was in there and return with the treasures. Well, lockdown gave me the time to do that because I I just have hours and hours and hours of recordings and demos and things when we've been making the last few records, at least, that I like to sort of jump into from time to time and listen to the sorts of songs in progress and things like that. So... I started jumping into them and then sent you from memory like three CDs worth of demos which you rightly culled down to. <laughs> I mean, I had some funny stuff on there, but... Um, we are we are putting out a separate uh, comedy record. <laughs> the funny stuff. The f- it's called The Funny Stuff. And the echo comes back empty For nothing is for free and I call out the window to the skeleton tree. There was ideas from, say, skeleton tree that had almost got there but hadn't quite got there and then we'd left them. Yeah, there, there was some very beautiful stuff on skeleton tree that were kind of half recorded. What's called first skeleton tree on side A of the seventh disc is really a really beautiful song, but these songs never really got off the ground in a way. Because of the circumstances of making that record, we just didn't have the 
energy or something like that to be able to bring these songs to light. I was really happy to hear that song actually released because it's full of meaning, that song. Some never move It's interesting to see how a song begins and how it becomes something else entirely different. There's quite a lot of those songs on here, early versions of Waiting For You, Girl In Amber. I guess they're deliberately put on the record to show the very moment a song presents itself. It's the aha moment. It really is the moment. It's like the moment where we think maybe there's something that maybe we can work on. And we go back to those moments where we're like, there's something here when we're getting lost in the studio and it's like, oh, maybe this isn't going anywhere. And then we go back to that to see what was there that sort of piped our interest. I really love that sort of thing, watching the way that it takes shape. I do have a soft spot for the very first thing. It's almost a philosophy of music with you, it seems, that there's a certain kind of energy in the first takes of things that just dissipates the more you play the song. The more you learn the song and the more well you can play the song, the less that energy of discovery remains in the song. And you in particular very much defer to that early stuff when we're trying to decide what is the best take of something and what is not. So. And there's something also too about the, when you don't really know what's going on, you're really in the moment. There's something fragile about it that you don't get the more times that you do it because then you're aiming for that. And when it's happened in the original take, you're not conscious of that at all. So it feels like a real pure delivery. Song, 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 the song it spins, the song it spins since 1984. Something to remember if anyone out there is uh, in the songwriting business is that you only need the tiniest of ideas for something quite beautiful to to come out of these things. So it's interesting to see these songs in their smallest form. And they're very, very different than the ones that you, that people know. It's interesting to look back at them and sometimes see how little the idea was that the moment was. When you see where it goes, like a a song like Girl in Amber or, uh, you know, even um, Suddenly Song 2 that never got somewhere. It was really nice to find that again. I remember we trying to push that one through I, you played it a lot it's called the sudden song uh, I, I remember being on the tour bus with that song and you just playing it over and over and over and over and over again thinking that someone might turn around and say wow that's a really good song but nobody <laughs> did <laughs> so burned out the bridge and they took you down and instantly I hope you someone think of me now I mean you're 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 able to understand the potential in a song before I can I'll go, really? You know, and you'll go, no, this is really, this has got something. And so you, you're, you I think, able to see the bigger picture. So, so it's always encouraging to work with you because I trust that instinct of yours and work towards that. And so it stops that fatal flaw that I have in, with my, in my own creative process of just shutting things down before they get started. That's the great thing about a collaboration. It's totally the great thing to have something you can bounce something off or somebody that can carry the confidence when when yours is waning. And Well, when you're working on your own on something, you just don't know. You never know. Yeah. Anyway, so what's your... Um, what, what are your favourite songs on the part two? 
I really like Big Dream with Sky. It's a giant insect. Big Dream with Sky. Yeah, I, I really like that one. Green triangulated head and bulging eyes. That particular song begins with uh, a dream image. Creaking multiple spines, tall as a house. It begins with a kind of horror image. Plowing through the summer grass towards you. And moves into something really very beautiful. Quite a strange thing, Big Dream with Sky. I also like the um, demo of Waiting For You because that's literally the moment that it's happening. The thing that I often hear you do in the studio, we, something will start up and I have no idea how you're going to land and I'm always waiting to hear what you're going to do and I'm always so surprised where you come in and what you do. Dark as the night, so the ivory sang and it's well, if you hear this version of Waiting For You, it literally has what's been described as a canning factory, as the beat, right? Which we took off in the end. There was a certain amount of heartbreak taking that beat off, but it was probably the right decision. Anyone listening to that can feel my pain of dealing with one of your loops. <laughs> I mean, I tend to think that the stuff, the interesting stuff often comes out of just a kind of frustration. On your part? On my part my part with not being able to shift the direction of what you're doing. So it becomes an incredible act of sort of creative dominance or something like that. We're both trying to push in a particular direction and it creates something quite magical. The thing uh, about Warren or about you is that uh, you can attach yourself to three circular notes and just play them for two hours <laughs> without any real development. <laughs> The thing about it is, very often, the good stuff is in the second hour. It's not in the first hour. It's in the hour of despair. <laughs> Have I been your memory? Where is better to love than ever can be? Your door is always open and your path is a song on, on uh, the sixth disc is um, Free to Walk, which is a song that I've sung with Debbie Harry on one of the Jeffrey Lee Pierce tribute albums or whatever they're called, the, the albums that were made of his songs after he died. They're great songs, you know. Jeffrey's songs are uh, quite something. I did, I think, maybe two, three, maybe even four songs with Debbie Harry over the years, which was just an incredible honour for me to sing with her. We didn't do it in the same studio. 
I just sing it and they'd send it off to Debbie and Debbie would sing so beautifully on these songs and send them back. So that was an incredible privilege. I heard that train come in round the curve Whistling and churning and changing my nerve That train is always coming Your path is free to walk Your train is always coming Your path is free to walk That train is always coming I mean, it's interesting looking at the B-sides, that the whole collection, the one and two. If you look at it, it's this kind of great overview of all the different attempts to move in different directions. Like, I love the part one, mostly because it's sort of the bad seeds that I remember as a fan and before I was involved, really. The same thing struck me as what struck me about why I loved the Bad Seeds, you know, when when the Bad Seeds started. You just seemed to be prepared to go anywhere. And I think the great thing with the, the B-sides is it's moments from each period thrown together, so it seems so incredibly kind of schizophrenic and it just goes all over the place. You know, even part two starts off sort of like guitar band stuff. Yeah, I mean, that, those songs... Um on part two are really interesting. The first three songs, uh, Hey Little Firing Squad, Fleeting Love. Accidents will happen with an awesome guitar solo, I must say. Thank you very much. Well, it raised an eyebrow in the studio, I have to say that. By the time you've got through the process of making an album, you've kind of lived the whole thing in a couple of weeks so much. And so these tracks, you've kind of worked on at the time and never revisited. So it's really lovely to just hear them suddenly. You don't have that same attachment to them like an album. The B-sides are freed up of the kind of weight of an album because there's these songs that you've worked on but for some reason they've been relegated to not getting on to the album and there's something fantastic about actually not hearing a whole album made with a certain idea in mind just to hear fragments from each session thrown together it just sort of j jumps all over the place yeah that's right I mean, it's, it's the only record I can sit down that we've made, you know, that I can sit down and just sort of uh, lie back and enjoy because they're rejected songs. They're forgotten and rejected songs. And so you can't help but kind of love them a little bit more or something like that. For me, the work on the B-sides actually, it became this meditation of sorts because I was just sitting in my studio in lockdown for a couple of months going through the B-sides and then working on them. And I think they were my first steps to, to try to find my way back into working again. Yeah, it was, it's, it was an interesting period. A lot of things reared their heads. We made Carnage. Warren, you started a... Um, I started a... a park. <laughs> a park for, for animals. park for animals with special needs. You wrote a beautiful book. I wrote a book. I don't know, I wrote a children's book for three-year-olds. But mostly through lockdown I did ceramics. I just sat in a, a studio and just made ceramic figurines. 
And they're, they're, they're incredibly beautiful too, what you've done. It's oh, thank you. But fantastic to see you jumping into a, a place that I imagine must be have certain anxieties about it. Well, it's, it's, you know, I mean, you play music has its anxieties, but they're kind of known anxieties, if you get what I mean. Yeah, you know the feeling. I know, I know the feeling very well. But doing the ceramics was uh, unknown anxieties, I would say. Just stuff that really went back to, can I even do this or am, am I go good at this or, or all this sort of stuff. These sorts of feelings that after you've done music for a long time don't weigh in so hard. So it's been really exciting to do that. I got a feeling I just can't shake I got a feeling The context for the version of Push the Sky Away with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra came from a proposal to perform our film works. We did four shows in Melbourne and then three in Sydney at the Opera House. And it was with a 40-piece choir and a 50-piece orchestra and Nick and me standing in front <laughs> playing with them. But it was just uh, an extraordinary experience. Thank you. We just decided to do a version of a song at the end with the choir, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, it was just an opportunity to have this incredible choir sing. That's amazing, that version. Yeah, it's very moving. Yeah. And that's it. Well, look, Warren, as ever, it's um, a pleasure to talk to you. Been fabulous talking to you, Nick. I've learned a lot. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Me too. You're a wise man, Mr. Ellis. Let's go and work on a track. Bye. Bye. Shall we um, finish with this little... But I, I actually, I, I, um, when I got the box set, I listened to the whole thing, and um, the first track on this is at like eighty-one. This is like forty years. Fuck. Forty years. Wow. <laughs> too much fucking perspective. <laughs> ah, it's kind of awesome too, you know. <laughs> I mean. Well, I have to say, I that I do feel very energised about whatever this project, this sort of endless project is. It feels very alive to me, uh, still. Like this last week we've been in the studio and what we've done in the studio in this last week is just completely nuts. So I'm very encouraged about that, actually. 40 years and still going. We've only just begun. <laughs>